really do believe that God wants us to be delivered and set free. He didn't save us so he could give us another church service. He saved us so we could go out and minister to people and snatch people from the fire. So there's a prayer in my book. Um, if you don't get the book, I made 50 copies of prayers and some tracks that we used to use when I was youth pastoring. Um, you can get over, go over there and get a prayer. I want everybody to get one. Plus, I have a book I'm going to give out uh, at the end when I'm done. So, I was raised in Detroit. I was raised in the hood. Uh, my grandparents owned a bar. Um, I never knew my father. My mom was a single mom. And my grandparents, the only thing I ever remember is being around drug addicts, alcoholics, and prostitutes. I was in bar room brawls. There were bullets flying, people getting beat up, all kinds of stuff. And um, I played so much pool and pinball, if I never play pool again, that'd be fine. My grandfather was an abusive drunk. And he, when he would get drunk, he would turn into Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and you never knew which person you were going to get. And when he was sober, he was semi-normal, as normal as an alcoholic could be, but I, I say in the book, instant idiot just to add alcohol. You never knew. Have you ever been around anybody that you, you, they're so drunk, you don't know what's going to happen, what's going to set them off? So that was my grandfather. So he used to beat all the women in his family, my mom. He broke my mom's nose and almost killed her. Um, he used to beat my grandparent, my grandmother, and I write about that in the book. Um, he beat me up one night because um, he didn't like what I was watching on television. Um, our house had burned down, so we were staying in a motel. And um, he woke up from one of his drunken stupors and didn't like what was on TV, and that's what set him off. So I was eight years old. My mom was in the hospital, and I had to go to the office of the motel to have them sign my mom out of the hospital. She had my grandfather arrested and thrown in jail. He ended up going to a mental hospital and they put him in, it's called Northville, I think it's still there, and I remember going to visit him. What I found out as I got older is abuse is a pattern, all right? My grandfather was abused, he abused my mom, my mom abused me, and my great-grandfather used to abuse my grandfather. He would get drunk, and he would hit my grandfather in the head with Coke bottles. And he would get concussions and just beat him senseless. So out of my grandfather's pain, he didn't know how to handle that, so he self-medicated. Because when you're addicted in your family, you're not the only one that's dealing with the addiction, it's the other people that have to live with you. And when you're watching this as a little kid, and that's all you've ever known, you think that is your portion. And I really believe, and I'm gonna go through a couple other things, but. I know that God protected me and that's why I'm here today. Amen. And you can, you, your past is part of you, but you can't let that dictate your future. I remember driving home from school one day and I was in the car and I thought, if I don't get out of Brightmore, I'm going to die here. There were biker clubs and everybody had a lot of respect for my grandfather, but he, they didn't have to live with him. He carried a gun everywhere he went and he was just, he was not a nice man. He put a contract hit on my, grand, on my dad because my dad wasn't Greek, my grandparents were Greek. My, grand, my dad left Michigan and I, I write about that in the book. But um, my mom, she used to self-medicate too. But she did it with prescriptions. She used to tell everybody um, that she had glaucoma and that was her way to get away with smoking pot. So um, my aunt was a local drug dealer. Um, and we were homeless in our car for a while. We lived in government housing. My mom was on food stamps. We got welfare. So I think I pretty much covered everybody in here. So you can't use where you've been as an excuse to not move forward. Part of the reason why I think we stagnate in our walk with the Lord is we don't forgive people. It took me five years after my mom died to forgive her. You can hold grudges against dead people. I bet you didn't know that. So, my mom sold prescription drugs. She used to shoplift. And because we couldn't afford food, there were a lot of times our food stamps didn't stretch till the end of the month. So that was the only way we could eat. Um, I would go to school during the day and I would come home and take care of my grandparents at night and I had to work their bar because they couldn't afford any, to pay anybody to work. So my grandmother had cancer, my grandfather had had a stroke, 
because his drinking, he had walked away from three strokes and the doctors told him, Nick, if you don't stop drinking, you're going to die. He had cirrhosis of the liver and he was... When you drink that much alcohol, he used to drink so much alcohol he would sweat it when he wasn't even drunk. I don't know if any of you have ever been around anybody like that, or maybe you are somebody like that. Your pores just can't hold the alcohol anymore. And I remember taking care of him, and it, it wasn't until he was in the chair for about seven years that he actually asked me for my forgiveness. And I, I write about that in the book. And um, God brings us through a lot of different things in a lot of different seasons in our life. So... Unforgiveness is the primary reason, and I don't want to go into a whole lot of stuff about my testimony, but what I want to do is I want to talk to you about who Jesus is, because he's the only one I know that can set you free. So, ten years ago, the Lord told me I needed to go back to Detroit, which I had vowed never to go back, but he took me back there. And he gave me a detailed plan of every school I ever lived in. We moved, I moved like 12 different times and went to 12 different schools because we were always getting evicted from somewhere. Okay, we were always getting the notice to quit. How many of you guys have ever gotten that? Three day notice to get your stuff and get the heck out. So they were always turning our lights off. So I know a little bit, cause see, we can see when somebody has a broken arm, but we can't see when somebody has a broken heart. And I know some of you, the reason why you're medicating is because you have a broken heart. And you have people in your life that you gotta forgive. And I remember sitting at my kitchen table and I remember reading through the Gospels and I heard Jesus' voice say, you have to forgive. And I said, Lord, but you don't know what they did to me. He says, but you don't know what they did to me. He says, if I can forgive those people, you can forgive the people that hurt you. Because if you don't forgive, I can't forgive you. Plain and simple. And see, a lot of times we, we want... It, the anger and the pain keeps us going. That's you know, it's just my rage that keeps me going. That's the rage that's going to kill you. Unforgiveness is a poison that you drink thinking the other person's going to die. So, I met Jesus when I was 26 years old, so statistically, I shouldn't even be around. Because most kids get saved between the ages of 4 and 16. Okay, so if you're a statistic and you're here tonight and you've never heard the gospel message, you are already outside the box. So the Lord wants to open up your heart and he wants you to know who he is. Because who is this God that you say you serve anyway? Who is he? When I opened my heart to Jesus, he opened doors for me to minister to people. I started teaching three-year-olds in Sunday school because that's where I was. Okay? And I remember the first time Tony and I were teaching, it was that they had kids on the bus ministry. And um, this little girl, Chloe, she started telling me about a story about what had happened the night before about her dad beat her mom up and the police came and took her daddy away. And it was at that point I thought, I can relate to what this little kid's going through. But nobody wanted to talk about some of this stuff in the church. So when I started sharing my experiences and trying to seek healing for myself, a lot of people in the church didn't know what to do with me because they had never suffered the level of abuse that I had suffered. They would just tell me to go down to the altar and pray. And those things aren't necessarily bad, but Jesus is the one who wants to set you free. And I mean free to the point where, where you're up giving your testimony. He, doesn't, he didn't make me forget the memories. The blood of Jesus doesn't give us amnesia. Okay? He wants us to be able to set other people free from what we've gone through. Okay, He gives you the authority. Once you've gone through something... You know why I took the children in the wilderness 40 years to make an 11 day trip? Because they wouldn't listen. He wants to set you free. And it's the grace and truth about yourself. Sometimes you have to look in the mirror and say, I am a sinner and this is what I did. And sometimes when you hear your own mouth saying it, it kind of slaps you upside the head and makes you deal with your crap. We've got to deal with our crap. I was looking for stability because we had moved so much. And I know some of you, maybe you're living on the streets. I don't know where some of you are. i got a pretty good idea. But um, Jesus really does want to set you free. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. 
Jesus is talking and he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there be that find it and they go in by it. But narrow is the path and this gate is difficult, which leads to life and there few there be that find it. He's talking about the word, it's the Greek word agonize. Many agonize. Have you ever watched the Olympics? Those athletes, what are they doing? They're pushing their bodies to the limit. They're huffing and puffing and sweating, and they're pushing their bodies to the absolute limit because they what? They want to win the race. You are in a race. You are in a war. It's time to, to figure out whose side you're on. We are in a war, people, and the enemy wants to kill you. He wants nothing better to do for you to get that last high, shoot that last bit of heroin, smoke that last joint, drink that last whatever, and you die in your sins and go to hell. He wants you to do that. He wants you to think that there is no hope because he only wants you to live for now. He doesn't want you to think about what's going to happen in 5, 10, or 15 years. He doesn't even want to think what's going to happen tomorrow. He wants to give you no hope. But Jesus says, I am your hope. We have to look at him and he is our example in all things. So what I want you to do is when the enemy talks to you, tell him to shut up. Get all ghetto on him and tell him shut up. When he tells you about your past, you're supposed to remind him of his future. And I see a lot of times I went up to Ventura and spoke to a group up there. And uh, there's a message on our website. It's called uh, Jesus is my safe space, which is my shirts. And he really is. You can either use the stuff that you've gone through to run away from God. And you know how many people blame God for the stuff that's happened to them? God, why did you let this happen? God didn't let any of this happen to me. He wasn't there when I was getting beat with with uh, extension cords and broomsticks and getting chased by my mom with a butcher knife. He wasn't there. That was not God. God is not a child abuser. I'm here to tell you that. He is Abba. That's why I have this song on our website, Abba, I'm yours. You really need to find out who this God is. If you didn't grow up without a, if you grew up without a dad, Jesus wants to be your Abba. He really wants to be your father. He is the perfect example in all things. So, I'm going to go through some steps. And I'm going to give you some practical things. And then I want to open up the altars to pray for people if you want prayer. So the first step we have to do is confess you're a sinner. If you don't repent. See, a lot of churches aren't talking about repentance anymore. You know, we got to repent. We have to admit that we're dirty, rotten, rotten stinking, cigarette-sucking sinners, Amen. and we need to repent. Amen. What does that mean? It means we do an about-face and we go the opposite direction. Nothing's going to change in your life until you change what you're doing. Because obviously, up to this point in your life, if what you were doing was working, you'd be delivered already. Amen. Right? Amen. Anything or anyone you cannot give up in your life is an idol. Yes. If it's a stick of tobacco, if it's weed, if it's alcohol, whatever it is. I remember my mom, I could give it up anytime I want. She was addicted to pain pills. She would go to the prescription, you know, she had Medi-Cal, Medicaid, whatever they had. And she would go to all these different doctors and get all these pain meds. My mom was addicted to pain meds. Percocet, Darvon, Darvacet, Valium. She was addicted to all that stuff. Why? Because she was self-medicating because she didn't want to deal with what she had to deal with. She didn't want to deal with the abuse. So she figured it'd be better to be loaded all the time. If that's you, God wants to deliver you. He wants you to know who He is. He's speaking to some of you right now. Step um, step three, assume the position through prayer. Please get a revela- revelation of this. The enemy wants to distort everything about God and who he is to you. If you don't tell evil spirits to get out and stop harassing you, they're not going to leave. You have to tell them to leave. Amen. You have to read your Bible. Once you've made a decision that you're going to do whatever it takes to be set free, you need to read your Bible, you need to rem- memorize scripture, and you need to do it for yourself. Okay, this book has 1,183 chapters in it. Yes, I've counted them. And it has 33,000 verses in it. Okay, there's people who have studied this book their entire life and they've never come close to fathoming the truths and the facets of who our God is. Our God is big. And if he was small, we would be able to figure him out. But he's huge, so you're going to spend your life figuring out who this guy is. Okay, this is not a sprint. 
This is a marathon. Amen. When you get saved, it happens like this. Becoming a Christian is a lifelong process. Amen. We all should wear a shirt that says under construction. <laughs> and if you really take that verse in 1 John 1, 9, He is faithful and just, you know how you know you're maturing in the Lord? is how fast you repent when you screw up. Amen. Jesus, I'm sorry. you got to go suck it up and go tell somebody you made a mistake or you need to correct your wrong. Amen. All right? You need to do that. Forgiveness. If you don't learn to forgive, you're going to stagnate in your walk. And I am not telling you to give whoever abused you or hurt you a free pass and to tell you that everything they did was okay. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm not even telling you you have to go back and fellowship with that person. I'm not even telling you you got to go have Sunday dinner with them and have them part of your life. It may be somebody in your family. But when you hold unforgiveness in your heart, there's a blockage there. There really is. This was part of my journey going back to Detroit. Unforgiveness is the primary blockage that prevents the Holy Spirit from changing your life. The Holy Spirit is real. He is the third person of the Godhead. Okay? In Colossians it says, In Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. The Holy Spirit comes to set us free. Right? When I went back to Detroit, I lived there half of my life. I drove downtown. And if you've ever seen pictures of City Hall, there's a big green guy in front of it. Go and look online. Well, I went down there and took my son with me, and we're driving down Jefferson there, right where the Tunnel to Canada is. And as I'm going to flip a U-turn, I notice there's a scripture on City Hall. I had never seen it before. I have pictures of it on my website. It blew me away. I whipped a U-turn and pulled around. I go, Lord, I never saw that before. Because when the Holy Spirit is illuminating your understanding and He gives you revelation to see things, you see things with the eyes of God. Okay. And the scripture was, where the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. Amen. And then the Lord told me, He says, but where my spirit is absent, there is bondage. That's a revelation from the Lord. That's for free. Boom. So, when you do what the Lord tells you to do, listen, God is always good. He's always good. He's always righteous. He's always loving. He's always kind. And He always wants what's best for you. Anything apart from that is a lie from the pit of hell and you need to tell that to shut up. Because when you walk in abuse and you have devalued yourself to the point you don't think you deserve anything better, you start to believe it. You might have to cut off toxic relationships. You might have to tell people, you know what, I, and I've told people this in my family, look, I love you, but I ain't watching the train wreck anymore. Amen. I'll help you get into Teen Challenge or Victory Outreach or whatever. Amen. I'll take you to your doctor's appointments. I cannot watch the train wreck anymore because it hurts me. You want to kill yourself, you're on your own because I don't think that that's God's best for you. Living long in the land is a blessing for the Lord. And if you're still alive and you didn't die in that emergency room when you were choking on your own vomit and somebody called the cops and the ambulance came, you still have something that you need to do. Amen. You are here as a testimony that God's not done with you yet. Do you understand that? Can, can, can you get a revelation and wrap your arms and your head around that? If you're still here, you still have something you need to do. Mm-hmm. What I want to do... I'm going to lead you... Well, we've got to have the fear of the Lord, too. Okay? There's people that... Um, they say, When I get to heaven, I'm going to point my finger in God. Say, no, you're not. <laughs> you are or certainly not. He is the creator of the universe. We need to have some respect for the living God. Amen. Okay? We need to learn how to get into God's presence. You've already admitted by being here that you need His help. Because you can't do it on your own. Look, I don't even know how God healed some of the stuff in my life. And if you're looking for a pattern and you're looking to try to figure out how He's going to do it, forget it. <laughs> you just need to lay on the floor and you need to listen to worship music and you need to say, Lord, I don't know how to, to fix this. And I've totally screwed up my life. You just need to lay on the floor and let the Holy Spirit move upon you and come upon you. Yeah. Can you do that? Because here, here's... here's Here's a, a secret that I learned. If you do it, you have to sustain it. If the Holy Spirit does it, guess what? It's His job to sustain it. Who's God anyway? Amen. How big is your God? Is He able to fix your crap? 
Is he able to fix your life? Is he able to bring your loved ones to Christ? Is he able to give you a job? Is he able to deliver you from drugs and alcohol? Or whatever it is you're doing? Is he able to change your thought process? Is he able to help you because you think your brain is so jacked up that you can't possibly memorize scriptures? I've prayed for a lot of people. God can fix that. As long as you're still breathing, there's still hope. There's always hope. So what I want you to do is stay and abide in Jesus. That means you need to stay as close to Him as you possibly can. What does that look like? Jesus is a person. Jesus is truth. Jesus is love. And His name, and, and, and it's a person. And His name is Jesus Christ. He walks in love. He walks in peace. What does that look like? If money and success and everything solved everybody's problems, look at Hollywood. <laughs> Broken marriages, kids are going to hell in a handbasket, everybody's jacked up there. Money and fame doesn't fix anything. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ. You have to deal with your issues in your life. You can't keep stuff hidden. You can't be in denial anymore. And it's always too soon to quit. Trust me, I know. I've been in ministry a long time and I'm quitting every week sometimes. Because it, sometimes it hurts. But, God... That's it. You can't look to somebody else as your role model. You've got to look at Jesus. We can't continue to compare ourselves to everybody else. We've got to look to the Lord. What I want you to do is I want you to get that prayer over there. But I want you to cut, start cutting distractions off of your life. Everybody's walking around with the phone. Everybody's doing this. They're, they're so distracted they're not even paying attention to what they're doing. It's time to turn off the phone and run to the throne. Can we do that? Amen. You know, we need to stop talking about, to everybody about our problems. We need to go talk to Jesus. Because they can't help you. They can love you and they can pray for you. And all those things are good. And I'm not downplaying those things. But they can't help you. They can't deliver you. Only Jesus can do that. Amen. Unforgiveness. When we go down to the altar... And we ask Jesus in our heart. And all of our sins are forgiven, and that's true. But we're not being restored. Why? Because we got unforgiveness in our heart. So here's what I did, and I found, uh, found that this to be the easiest way. You have to make a list of everybody that you perceive that has hurt you. I don't care how long the list is. Go to Walmart and buy a couple of notebooks. Write down everybody's name. Doesn't matter. Living or dead. And you need to start going through this list. Lord, as an act of my will, I choose to forgive that person. You, because what, Lucifer got kicked out of heaven, right? Because he said, I will be like God. And God said, no, you will not. I choose as an act of my will. When we make those inner vows, those are heavy things. I will never do, I made a vow I would never be poor again. I would never live in my car. I would never eat fried bologna, macaroni and cheese, and top ramen. Okay? You might like that. God bless you. I will never eat that again or spam. But <laughs> you need to understand as the act of your will. There was a scripture up here, uh, Romans 12. If you read the rest of the chapter, he talks about living sacrifice. Living sacrifices crawl off the altar and it's time for us to die already. <laughs> We just need to die. Because dead people don't complain. We all have to do it. And I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that I don't miss it all the time. I screw up all the time. But the thing is, when I go to work, and I'm driving to my job every morning, I work at a ministry. And I have other people that are watching me. And I take that very seriously. And I've had to go apologize to students and say, you know what, I was acting like a jerk that day. I'm sorry, would you forgive me? There's no shame in asking somebody to forgive you. What's the worst they could say is no. And then you did what God told you to do, and He's going to honor your obedience. It's not a lot of coulda, shoulda, woulda. It's not like you have a lot of wishbone and no backbone. It's time to move forward. Everybody here has a ministry, and God wants to use you. He really does. Take your misery and turn it into your ministry. Can you do that? So I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, the leadership here for allowing me to come and speak. There is a message on my website. I just want to encourage you to go watch it. I have a lot of anointed people. If you want to hear more of Richard's testimony, 
Um, I had him on my radio show. Um, you can go there and there's a video that he did at the castle in Riverside. But um, God wants to use everybody because we don't have a lot of time left. Mm -hmm. So, if you've never accepted the Lord Jesus in your heart, I don't mean just Him to be Savior. He's not on the cross anymore. I want Him, you to know Him as the Lord of your life. If you want to accept Him right now as your Lord and Savior, I want, to, I want you to come up here and make a public profession of your faith. Now, I was 26 years old. I got baptized with my husband. And we used to take the kids to the to the ocean and do baptisms and I used to tease him, give me five dollars and I'll hold you down till the bubble stop, but um, it's okay to laugh. But God wants to use you. And I know there's somebody here, there's a couple people here, what I've talked to you about, the Lord's touching you. And you're like, man, she's speaking to me. Man, I went through that. I'm homeless. You know, I, had, um, I was from an abused family. I know what it was like to not have enough to eat. Even if you don't know, if you have somebody that you want to forgive, but you just can't, and you say, I don't, you don't know what they did to me. I don't need to know what they did to you. Jesus knows, and he's going to honor that. Yeah.